In Acts 20, Paul says, And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. He knows what's coming. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy. When my wife and I went to go eat last night, finally, there was such a joy in knowing, not just the food, don't get me wrong, in that we, I mean, we high-fived each other. I'm so proud of my wife. This was a big deal for us to be able to step in and start taking on long-term fasting. We'll probably start doing a lot more one-day intermittent fasting, fasting before things come, maybe one or two days, maybe three. But to step into a, a good long week, there was such a joy knowing, Lord, I finished this, this mission this week strong. We didn't cheat. We did nothing. Oh, we, we did it. And Paul says, let's look at the bigger picture. I don't care what's facing me in Jerusalem. I'm going. I know this, the Spirit warned me I'm going to be bound. But I'm going to finish my race, race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. A couple of guys at work found out I was fasting. A couple of them I was able to share, hey, I'm, I'm fasting for you. They're like, what? I'm fasting because I'm praying for you. I'm asking the Lord to, to save you. They didn't, they're not big fans of that answer, but that's okay. Just you bring it out. You let them know. Luke 9, look at Jesus, because, you know, Paul's a great example. Let's look at the example. Luke 9, 51, we see, he says, Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, that as he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, he sent messengers before him. And they went, and they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. Jesus says, here it is, blinders on. I'm going that way. I'm not going to be distracted by anything. Hebrews 12 says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great cloud of witnesses, I want you to know, those of you next year that want to know how it went and how you should get in the fast, I'm now witness for you. And those who participated, we're witness for you. Jesus Christ will sustain you. You can do this. We are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy, the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. <laughs> the joy set before him of going to the cross. Man, that's big. That is our God. And that's what he's calling us to. The word resolute in the dictionary, it means it's an adjective, and right? it means admirably purposeful, determined, and unwavering. It means faithful, loyal, constant, staunch, steadfast. And this is where I saw Jesus the most. Firm in adherence to whatever one owes allegiance. And you see Jesus in there, firm in adherence to whatever one owes allegiance. That's Jesus. Jesus said, I, I have allegiance to my Father in heaven, and nothing will break me from going to do what I've come to do. Firm in his allegiance. What a, what a mighty definition. And Jesus is resolute in what he's going to do, and he's calling us to be resolute. We're going to journey with him here in just a minute. If you haven't already, turn to Matthew 26 and just hold your place. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful that you love us, and we're asking that your Holy Spirit this morning would show us how to be resolute, without fear, firm in adherence to you whom we owe allegiance and following out the mission you've given us. We love you, Lord. Please open our hearts and our minds this morning and change us today. We're not here for pretending Sunday time. We're here to get changed. Break us, Lord. Remold us in your image. And send us out in your power. In Jesus' name, amen. The point of this spiritual exercise was really to learn how to operate within the parameters God has given us, to seek him with less distraction, to be more resolute, to be set in our ways, and to journey knowing he's going to provide for us. Matthew 26, we're just going to read a few chunks at a time and do a little kind of commentary in between. I want you guys to see this picture of our resolute God. Matthew 26, 1. Now it came to pass... When Jesus had finished all these sayings, then he said to his disciples, you know that after two days 
is the Passover, and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. And the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Right, they're not really even that firm in what they want to do, cowardly. But we come upon this, this short time period in the word where we can see the active events of Jesus as Matthew's telling us about them. And also we get to see some behind the scenes knowledge. And you think, wow, where do we get that? Well, I did a lot of looking between all of the gospels to kind of put this event together that we're looking through, these two events that we're going to look at today. And we know that there's a spot in a couple of the gospels where, where you see Jesus is going to stop in Bethany, right, for, for dinner at Mary and Martha's house. We call it the anointing at Bethany. And so we see in John 12, 9 through 11, now a great many of the Jews knew that he was there. And they came, not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he raised from the dead. But the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also, because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. So there's a spot, right? They're coming out, and they're walking towards Jerusalem, and, and they're going to come into this spot in Bethany. They're going to sit down. And they're going to have a dinner. And they're already plotting behind the scenes. And we know about it. Because the chief priests are there. They're present at this moment. In the other gospels, you can see it. And so, of course, they run right out. And they go to tell the leaders what's going on and where he is and how are we going to get him. So this is planning. And it's great to get the full view and see. And Jesus comes in. He says, all right, let's go that way. Matthew sets the scene. Jesus tells his disciples, the first thing he says is, hey, in two days is a Passover, and then I'm going to be delivered up, be crucified. I'm going to death. It's a big blow. Lord, what do you mean? He says, but, but we're going to go forward anyway. No, Lord, let's stop and hide out. Lord, let's go over here. Let's find somewhere to be protected. No, no, no. I was just letting you know. We're moving forward regardless. This is the direction. Can you just imagine walking with him and trying to fathom i'm gonna i'm gonna die in a couple of days but let's go over this way let's go ahead. let's go to where i'm gonna die jesus there's other things we can do no you're, you're not understanding i'm set that's the way we're going it doesn't matter and the lord he hasn't neglected to prepare them right this isn't really a surprise although they sure seem surprised we just came through the last i don't know six eight weeks going through chapters 24 and 25 and those were all preparations. He told them parables about what it was going to be like, how they should be watchful, what they should be doing, how they should be preparing, what to look out for. He's been telling them and telling them and telling them. Remember, it starts right here. He says, when Jesus had finished all these sayings, it's like, listen, we just came out of this big prep time, and now I'm letting you know I'm going to die. Let's keep going. They're, they're trying to reconcile all this in their mind. And believe it, that's us. I get it. We need to take the word sometimes. We need to chew on it for a minute and think, Lord, I, I don't understand. Sure you do. I've already told you hard times are coming. I've already told you the world is against you. I've already told you people aren't going to like you. I've already told you people are going to get bummed at you when you try and tell them they're a sinner. This is how it's going to be. But you're going to do it anyway. You know the good that's coming. And so they're cruising along, and they're all kind of like, oh, ah, oh, oh, oh. And Jesus says, I got, a, I got a cool plan. You guys know what we should do since we're on our way to my death? Let's go stop at Martha's house and let's have a meal. Let's kick back. Put our feet up, recline, we'll get served, we'll have some dinner. Jesus, you out of your mind? Death is on the line. I know. Let's go celebrate. He actually comes and he says, believer, do we? Do we right now? Can we sit down and relax and know that God has us? Relax. Enjoy that dinner. Like, ah, my God's got me. I'm not worried. Because that's what he does. Jesus, let's just stop here and rest for just a minute. Don't worry about what's coming in the future. It's not here yet. We're here right now in the moment. Relax in me. Verse 6, back to the main text. And when Jesus was in Bethany, at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him, having an alabaster flask, a very costly fragrant oil. She poured it on his head as he sat at the table. But when his disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? This fragrant oil might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus was aware of it, he said to them, Why do you trouble this woman? She's done a good work for me. 
For you have the poor with you always, but me you do not always have. For in pouring this fragrant oil on my body, she did it for my burial. Surely I say to you, wherever this gospel is preached in the whole world, what this woman has done will be told as a memorial to her. My father-in-law, Pastor Phil, made an interesting point. We we're talking in between services. So it isn't interesting that Jesus was always out ministering and ministering and ministering. And at this particular scene, he's ministering still. And only one woman, this one woman comes up, says, let me minister to you, Jesus. Let me pour out on you a ministry. Let me bless you. I hope we find ourselves more in that position once in a while. But here's Jesus sitting at the table. He's eating. He's resting with loved ones. Enemies all around him. Pharisees and Sadducees are there. We know that from the other Gospels. They're hanging out, checking out what's going on. They're going to report on him and take their little spy information back to Caiaphas. People are scheming. There's stuff going on. They're talking about the oil and all the disciples get indignant. Even though kind of Mark and John pare it down a little, right? Matthew says, and the disciples were indignant. Mark just says, and some were indignant. And John, because I think John kind of had a heart and an eye for that because he was so close to Christ. He actually just calls out Judas Iscariot in his gospel. And Judas complained. Right? Just Judas. He's got an eye on him. He's like, what's going on, Judas? He knows. He's been so close to Christ. Like, Something's off with Judas. He knows he's got it in his heart. But regardless if it was a group of guys or one guy, they were all there. They all heard something. And what matters is Judas was the ringleader. As long as Judas is mentioned, we know it's correct. Because Judas was the one who's about to head out and have some bad stuff happen. Judas is about to give his life over completely. In fact, it doesn't actually say it in Matthew's portion of this. And he goes out to plot. Judas is about to get overtaken. But in Luke, we know the full story. We get a little bit more. In Luke 22, it actually says, Then Satan entered Judas, surnamed Iscariot, who was numbered among the twelve. So he went his way and conferred with the chief priests and captains how he might betray him to them. And they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he promised and saw opportunity to betray him to them in the absence of the multitude. Right? Some more of that behind the scenes. We know that Judas is about to actually let Satan enter him, to just give over completely. You know how many times in Scripture it says Satan himself enters someone? It's not a lot. It's not the regular. Nothing irks me more than people like, oh, yeah, the devil made me do it. Man, you're not on the devil's radar. I'm not on the devil's radar. He's got minions for that. This is the Satan. Okay, this is, this is a big moment. This is the battle right here. This is the pre-battle of the battle of battles. Satan himself says, I'm entering Judas. He's mine. He's, the, he's right there. He's in Christ's midst. I'm going to move in and work on this. And he just, he gives up. He allows him in there. And he goes out to do what he's supposed to do, unfortunately. Verse 14 through 16. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought the opportunity to betray him. So here he is, right? Matthew just says he went out and he went and sought. But we know from the full four pictures of the Gospels that he's filled with Satan now. He's on a mission. He's out to get Christ. And 30? 30 pieces of silver? 30 pieces of silver was the price paid for a slave that was gored to death on accident by someone else's ox. A dead slave. And then the owner said, here, I'll give you 30 for that dead body. And move on. This is the price given for Judas for our God. 30, 30, here's a $20 bill. Tell us where he's at. Judas was like, sweet, it's 20 bucks I didn't have yesterday. Like, that's it. It's so, it's so small. It's so demeaning. It's so Christ-like, isn't it? The smallest, the most demeaned that he would come to us, that he had nothing that would bring him to us, right? That he wasn't beautiful, this humble servant God. Here's Jesus sitting at the table, literally surrounded by his enemies. This prepared table for him. Someone will prepare this for you. Come, sit, relax. His head is actually being anointed with oil, like poured out on him. And he's just in it like, man, this is the spot to be, right? Now, you just imagine this. I was looking like, what, Lord? Look at this. What, what's he doing? Shh, listen, do you remember the words of your forefather, David? Psalm 23, you prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. 
and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what I would have told him. We just poured it right out, like right there in the presence of my enemies. Doesn't matter. Calm down. My head's anointed. The table's prepared. Enemies are circling like you're not welcome to sit here. This isn't your table. Resolute in what he was about to do. I'm reading a fantastic book. I've mentioned it a couple times. It's one of the few that I'd say go get it if you can. It's by Louis Giglio. It's part of a series, and it's called Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. And it talks about keeping our thoughts in Christ. Talks about not living up here. The problem, believers, the reason we aren't resolute, the reason we choose not to do a thing like a fast, the reason we fall away and go back to the pig pen and to the vomit, like that dog returning over and over. It's because somewhere in our mind that we can't do it. I can't live without that. I can't do this. I'm not able. I'll be made fun of. I'll fail. Whatever. We, we play the whole scene out in our head before it ever happens. Christ says we can capture all those thoughts. 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 5 says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. I know that until your hands do evil and your mouth speaks evil, that we say, well, it wasn't sin, it was just temptation. But it works up here, too, if that thought comes in and you decide to entertain it and play through it and let it keep you from doing good, then what you're doing is you're mustering up sin in your mind that's going to eventually come out of your hands and your mouth. Guaranteed. Take every thought captive. Sit at the table that Christ has prepared for you. Let him anoint your head with the oil of the Holy Spirit and don't give the enemy a seat. He said, this feast is for Jesus Christ and I alone. No one else is welcome here. I'm going to look my Savior right in the eye while they're whispering in my ear. I'm not, hey, shh, I'm trying to eat with Jesus here. Go away. You sat right in front of the enemy. You're not bothered one bit. Resolute and our knowledge of his victory. Verse 17, back to the main text. Now in the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, where do you want us to prepare for you to eat the Passover? He said, go in the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them. They prepared the Passover, and when the evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. Now as they were eating, he said, Assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Each of them began to say to him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said to him, He who dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. Jesus is going to throw some more of that knowledge out. So I love. Tells him, go out. Where, where should we eat? Jesus, we, we left Bethany. Now we're into Jerusalem. Where are we going to prepare the fast? Or the... the the Passover. He says, I want you to, to go out. And in, in Matthew, he just says, go out, tell a man, and, and show up. Go on in. He'll be ready for you. But what we see in the other Gospels is he actually says, go out and look for a man carrying a pitcher of water, carrying down the street, and follow him. You think, that'd be, a, that'd be hard to see. Why would that be such a big sign? Because probably no man would be carrying that pitcher of water down the street at that time. That was a woman's job, and that was a children's job. It was some servants' jobs. And it wouldn't be just some man walking down the street with a pitcher. So contextually, that would go. God carrying a pitcher down the street. Okay, we'll follow him. And he gets there, and I love it that the man preparing the house, I can only imagine he must have been resolute and saying, I'm preparing for the Passover, and something good's going to happen because he's prepping. He's using anyone available. Hey, you, I know it's not your job, but go get some water. And you and prep, and when the disciples show up and say, the Lord needs to eat here, he's like, I know, come on in. It's prepared. I've prepared an upper room for you. Like, it's just, it's coming together. And as the Lord puts out that word on them, the disciples are like, Jesus said to do it. Let's go do it. I'm trying to count. Peter's like, well, how many times did you count he was wrong? John? John's like, I don't know. James, 120. He's been right 197 times out of how many? 197? He hasn't been wrong yet. He hasn't been wrong yet. So let's go do it. He said to do it. Let's go do it. So they, they move off in that confidence. Their, their resolution is starting to build because Christ is never wrong. He's never been wrong with us before. Let's follow him. It made me think a lot about David and his Psalms. I love in Psalm, one, Psalm, Psalm 119, he says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. 
I have sworn and confirmed that I will keep your righteous judgments. I am afflicted very much, but revive me, O Lord, according to your word. David says, I'm, I'm set. Lord, your word's a lamp to my feet, to my path. I've sworn and confirmed I'll follow you. I'll keep your judgments. I'm hurting, Lord. I'm, I, things are going bad. But heal me according to your word. Revive me. I'm resolute. I'm going to do it. And he sticks through. So here's Jesus. He's sitting at the table now, and at the second table right now. He's at the Passover table, knowing Jesus is plotting to get him. And it catches me kind of off guard. He says, when are you going to betray me? And they're all like, what? N not me, right? Not me, right? Lord, Lord, not me, right? It's not going to be me, right? All they seem to be worried about is, is this going to be them? Like, wouldn't you, wouldn't there be a great sorrow if you're sitting in the presence of, you're, you're kind of grappling with believing he's the son of God, but you kind of come most of the way, like, I, I'm fairly certain he's God in flesh, can't comprehend it, but we're thinking it's true because we watched him do all this stuff. And he says, when are you going to betray me? If I came to you guys, next week I stood up in the pulpit and I said, next week, by the end of the week, one of you is going to betray this church. You're going to hurt this church in a huge way. The response should be, let's pray against that. Let's pray. That can't be. But I'm willing to bet a bunch of you would come up and be, were you talking about me? That's what I would do. And look, we know because that's what they do. Is it me? Is it me? It actually says in John 13 that John is right there. It says, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. We know that's John. He refers to himself that way. And he's leaning on him. And Simon Peter's like, hey, 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 John. He motions to him, ask the Lord who he's speaking about. See if it's me. See if it's you. Their only concern is who is it? Whose fault is it going to be? Like they've still just got this mindset. They're not ready yet. They're not quite ready yet. And the Lord's got more to do in them. But don't be too hard on them because we fall in there so often. But let's look at what it should have been. It should have been. Lord, let's pray against that, Lord. This is such great sorrow, Lord. Why? This No, Lord, this can't happen. How can we beat this? Verse 24 and 25, back in the main text. The Son of Man indeed goes just as it is written of him. Man, his attitude just doesn't change, does it? Listen, I know. I know what Judas is up to. The Son of Man's going to do it. I'm going to go. It doesn't matter. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. And Judas, who was betraying him, answered and said, Rabbi, is it I? He said to him, you've said it. You've said it. But we see there's this confusion in general, right? I had to look at some more of the gospel because he just, that it, it, he said, you've said it, go. But we look at John 13, same scene. Jesus answered and said, it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread when I have dipped it. And having dipped the bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. But no one at the table knew for what reason he had said this to him. Some thought, because Judas had the money box that Jesus said to him, buy those things we need for the feast, or he should give something to the poor. But having received that piece of bread, he went immediately out, and it was night. They're in this confusion, and this is kind of a second little point. It's hard for us to be resolute when we live up here, when we get caught up in thoughts, because everybody likes to play out conversations. One of the hardest things, I'll be honest, one of the hardest things to approach your brother or sister in the Lord about to maybe have a correction talk with them or maybe offer a word of advice to them or say, hey, that might be dangerous. I'm going to take a, a wild stab. It's because what we do is spend two days before wringing our fingers saying, what if they were small like this? What if they were... Just do it because it's right because God said to. Stop worrying about what they might say. Go do it. Stop living up here. Jesus Christ lives here. He lives in our hearts and our souls that he might have total control over everything up here. But that second piece, here they are confused. Why is Judas going out? Where is he going? Why would Jesus say that to him? We don't understand, Lord. They got a little bit of lack of understanding. I mean, this scene, this whole portion is spoken about. There's prophecies coming for this. A good, easy one. Zechariah 11, 12 through 13. Then I said to them, if it is agreeable to you, give me my wages. And if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, throw it to the potter, that princely price they set on me. So I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. There's that price paid for Jesus. Zechariah, 
Zechariah just talks about it a long, long time before Jesus is on the scene. Here's that money, and here's what it's going to go to. It's going to be a princely price, and it's going to end up in the hand of the potter. It's going to be pretty much useless. If they'd only read a little more, if they'd only asked a few more questions and understood what was coming. And I don't want to get too down on the disciples. I get it. I got 2,000 years now to be able to look back through Scripture and time and, and standing on the shoulders of brothers and, and sisters who have been interpreting his word and bringing it together and teaching. But these guys had all the prophets. They had all the Old Testament. They had the greatest teacher in the universe right in front of them. They should have known. So believer, you can't, you can't know what's going on if you're not reading his word. I feel like we've been talking about this a lot in church, so it must still be needed to be talked about. If you aren't reading God's word you can't possibly know what God is desiring or what God is speaking to you. I'm dealing with people right now that are angry because they say they're praying to the Lord and he's speaking to them, but nothing is changing. So what's he speaking to you? And they'll tell me, I'm like, that's not from the Bible. He couldn't possibly have said that to you. That's not Jesus. How do you know what God's talking to me in my personal head? Because God can't say anything else to you that he wouldn't say to me that's not in his scripture. It's not possible. Jesus Christ does not speak outside of his word. Everything that he does is in his word. If you've only read a handful of the 66 books, and you're like, yeah, Jesus speaks to me all the time. What is he saying? I'll bet most of those are your thoughts. They're my thoughts a lot of times. They have to be Jesus's thoughts. And the boys had to get together and start reading a little more. Start understanding they were missing out. Believer, don't be misled to think the Lord is just going to meet you where you are and tell you everything you need to know if you never pick up his word. And if you've not read the entire word of God, if you've not read all 66 books, I challenge you this year, make that your goal. Get through the word of God and hear the whole counsel or you're going to miss out. You will not be able to be resolute because all the blank spaces, that's where the enemy's like, got you. It'll be easy for him. Matthew 4, 4 tells us, but he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every thought we have should proceed from the mouth of God. Every action should proceed from the mouth of God. Everything that we do should be by the word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Or we won't make it to resolution. We won't make it. We're going we're gonna to start closing up here. We're not going to read any more from Matthew this morning. But I want to just pick on two guys that I love so much to be our example as we head out of here. Talking about resolution, there's so many examples. But one of my all-time favorites, and it always will be, and I think I'm to the point now where I know I say this is my favorite verse a lot from the pulpit, but in 20 years I have yet to find a character I love more than Daniel. Daniel is one of my favorite. Daniel 1, 6 through 8. Now from among those sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Botelshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Daniel purposed in his heart. Daniel knew the word. Daniel purposed. Daniel prayed three times a day. Daniel fasted. Daniel overcame a 70-year run in Babylon. No problem. I mean, he did it with his eyes closed. No problem. He overcame four rulers in two different nations in 70 years under wicked pagan rule. You know how he did it? You want to know the real big secret? The secret, the only secret I'm allowed to promote from the pulpit? He read his word. He read his word. You know what he had? Jeremiah, the very last prophet, the, the contemporary prophet of that, literally that transition moment between the end of Israel's time with any kind of freedom and going into Babylon in captivity. Jeremiah, some of his final words in chapter 29, says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters. And take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands. So that they may bear sons and daughters. That you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive. Pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. He says pray for your captors. For thus says the Lord God. After 70 years are completed of Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good work.
towards you and cause you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. When he saw the horses on the horizon, Daniel looked at his buddies and said, hey, go grab the scrolls. Rolled up Jeremiah, put it in his pocket, says, we're armed and ready. Doesn't matter. He had no idea if he would do the whole 70 years. He had no idea. But he knew it would only be 70. And he knew that he was supposed to build a house. He knew he was supposed to promote marriage. He knew he was supposed to pray for the enemy. And in that, isn't it interesting, in that, the Lord said, will be your peace. In that. Joshua 14. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, as he said, these 45 years. And ever since the Lord spoke this word to Moses while Israel wandered in the wilderness. And now here I am this day, 85 years old. And yet I am as strong this day as on the day that Moses sent me. Just as my strength was then, so now is my strength for war, both for going out and for coming in. 85 years old. 12, 40-year-old men, young men, 40 years old, close to my age, 12, 12 very young men, went out, powerful men, went out. And the Lord sent him. He said, Moses says, go out. Go out and spy out the land. I'm giving it to you. And they go out and they spy it out. And 10 of the 12 start living up here. There's no point in scripture where it says they interacted with the Anakites or anybody else in the wicked land. But they come back and they say, we looked like grasshoppers to them in our own eyes, they told us. How do you know what they thought of you? You never said a word to them. They, they started making conversations. We can't do it. We look like puny to them. They, we, they must think so little. Though. Did you go see them? I thought you were spies. Did you go before them? How, how do you? God's giving this to you. This is yours. This is your promise. Be resolute. But alas, the ten prevailed. And just Joshua and Caleb. Joshua waits 45 years before Moses finally passes and gives him the torch. And Joshua stands up and says, ready to go. Let's do it. Ready to go. Nothing has changed in 40 years wandering in the desert. God's word hasn't changed. His promise hasn't changed. I'm still ready for what he has for us. Resolution. Resolution like nothing else. Church, we have the same promise. It's time to set our faces towards accomplishing his goal. It's time to set our faces towards accomplishing his goal. He has a goal in this church. I promise you, I love it when I get to use the word promise because it's so rare, but I promise you because God's word does. If you set your face towards the work of God resolutely to obey him at all cost, you will be victorious and you will enter the rest of our God. For the rest of eternity, you will have that peace in his kingdom and paradise. Amen? Amen. Lord Jesus, just please speak deep in our hearts today. We want to be so resolute in all of our actions and thoughts that nothing can stop us, Lord. Nothing. We move forward without fear. We move forward in the courage, the righteousness, and the strength of our God to do all the mighty things that you desire to accomplish. And Lord, we tell the world it's because of you. We give you the glory for making us weak, frail, fearful humans powerful. Receive the glory and the praise. Help us to set out in Jesus' name. All his children said, amen. Amen, you guys. God bless.